Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar on change detection for land cover mapping. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and my colleague and I, Amber McCullum, will be giving the presentation today along with a guest speaker, Jenny Hewson, for Con from Conservation International. Just as a reminder, this is the second of two sessions that we've had on change detection. And then with each session, we have a session A and session B that are repeat of each other. So you only need to sign up um, for one of these sessions, either session A or session B. All our recordings, the presentations, and the homework assignments will be found at our website listed here. And then following each lecture and the exercise, we'll have a Q&A session. For this webinar series, we'll have one homework assignment that will be available after this session, and all answers must be submitted via Google Forms. You can also get a certificate of completion if you attend both live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. The deadline for that assignment is October 19th. You'll get the certificates about two months, two months after the end of this course. There are several prerequisites for this course. The first is Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, which you can watch from our website anytime, or if you have equivalent experience from a class um, course on remote sensing, that works as well. Um, also, we advise that you take the advanced webinar on land cover classification with satellite imagery. That's also available on our website. Um, that's especially so for this particular exercise that you'll be doing this week. Um, and you must download and install QGIS and in all accompanying software. Um, we have a link to exercises that will help you do that. You also have to download and install the R statistical program and also download and install R Studio. Again, to access our course material, you can go to our website listed here, and then we also have it um, available through GoToWebinar today. So last week, we did an introduction to change detection and also did a short exercise um, using QGIS. This week, we'll be co conducting another kind of change detection with QGIS and R. So today's agenda includes doing an overview of supervised classification and then describing methodology for two-day classification and change detection. And that includes image preparation, developing training sites, um, a discussion on random forest, classification refinement, and lastly, image post-processing. And then following that lecture by Jenny, um, Amber McCollum will lead you through exercise two. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Hewson from Conservation International. Here you go, Jenny. Thank you, Cindy. And again, I am Jenny Hewson from Conservation International. And first of all, we will quickly discuss supervised classification. So in image classification, it is important to consider that there are generally two methods, supervised and unsupervised. In supervised classification, the analyst is the expert. And the analyst uses their knowledge to generate expert-defined representative areas of known vegetation or land cover types. These are termed training areas or training data, and these are then used to train the classification algorithm. The algorithm then uses this information of known information to identify and label areas that are similar to the training data. Conversely, in unsupervised classification, the algorithm drives the process. 
and it clusters pixels into class groupings based on generally a number of user specified classes. The analyst then assigns each of the class groupings to a land cover class. So again, in a supervised classification approach, the analyst defines the training data based on their knowledge of what is on the ground, and then they generate training sites, which can be done by digitizing a polygon, for example. And as Cindy mentioned in session one, this is all based on exploiting the reflectance properties of different materials whether that is water, bare ground, or vegetation. And these different spectral reflectances are called spectral signatures. Each material has a spectral signature. In this example above, we can see that water generally has a low reflectance, which is slightly higher in the blue portion, but then declines. Conversely, coniferous forests and deciduous forests have these peak and valley reflectances, which again we can exploit when we are classifying imagery. So with this information, one is then able to build a training data set of mean spectral signatures for the various classes of interest. And then the classification algorithm uses this information to match unknown pixels with the mean spectral signatures of the classes of interest and identify the best match or class for that pixel. Element two of this webinar includes reviewing the methodology for two date or multi imagery supervised classification and change detection. So, in the two date supervised classification and change detection process, there is a sequence of steps that are implemented in the methodology. And these include first, a number of pre-processing steps, importing the imagery, applying the cloud mask as needed, creating a two-date image stack, followed by enhancing the image in terms of stretching and exploiting different band combinations. Step three includes the development of training data sites that are then used to run the random forest algorithm, which will be implemented in R. Step five includes refining the classification by tweaking the training data to get the best classification possible. And then step six is the post-processing step. On the pre-processing side, we first need to deal with the presence of clouds. Clouds affect the ability of optical satellites to see the land surface, and persistent cloud cover is a factor in many areas of the world, especially in the tropics, and can result in incorrect classifications. So the process of cloud masking aims to remove cloudy pixels and the Landsat surface reflectance products, which as Cindy mentioned in the first session, are generated using lead apps and more recently the Landsat surface reflectance code, are supplied with a cloud mask layer in which pixels are flagged as clouds based on their reflectance value. And you can see an example of the cloud mask layer for Landsat 8 in this figure on the right. So again, the analyst can use this mask 
to remove or mask out cloud in each image. The next step is to take the two images that have been cloud masked as needed and generate a stacked to date multi band image. In the hands on exercise, this would include taking the date one image, which is a Landsat 5 image with six bands, bands one through six, and the date two image, which is a Landsat 8 image with seven bands, one through seven. And then stacking these into a combined image of both dates with all the bands. So we now have a new 13 band image in which bands 1 through 6 are Landsat 5. And bands 1 through 7 of Landsat 8 will be in bands 7 through 13. And again, you can see the bands in this new combined stack in the figure on the right. The next step in the classification methodology is to perform various image enhancements to improve the interpretation of the image and essentially highlight different features that are present. First, we can stretch the image by adjusting the minimum and maximum pixel value ranges used or by using the standard deviation of the pixels. To highlight the utility of different band combinations, we have a figure on the right and in the natural color or true color band combination in the second row, we're capturing how our eyes perceive color. So the red band, which is band three in Landsat five and seven is displayed as red, the green band displayed as green and the blue band displayed as blue. Conversely, the color infrared and false color band combinations or, or color composites can be used to highlight, for example, vegetation by exploiting the different reflectance properties of vegetation in different portions of the spectrum. Again, as Cindy mentioned in session one. So in this color infrared example in the top row, the reflectance of healthy vegetation increases dramatically in the near infrared. So by displaying the near infrared band, which is band four in Landsat five and seven, and band five in Landsat eight, in the red filter, we get a bright red color for vegetation. So how does this work in a two date multi-band image, such as the one we will use in the hands-on exercise. Now, instead of six or seven bands, we have these 13 bands all stacked into one image. And the beauty of this multi-date stack is that we can now highlight changes between the two dates. For example, if we place band 12, which is a shortwave infrared from date two in the red filter and band five, which is our shortwave infrared from date one in the green filter and band eight, which is our blue band from date two in our blue filter, we can see the change that has occurred between these two dates. And again, our example is from an area in southeast Tanzania. Now we have our stacked multi-date cloud mast image that we know how to exploit by stretching and using different band combinations to highlight different features. 
And we use this to develop training data sites that in turn will be used to train the algorithm. A few guidelines on collecting training data include making sure the training sites are distributed across the entire image, making sure that both change and no change areas are captured, keeping in mind that the size of the training data is, is driven largely by the spectral characteristics of the image. In general, large training sites are reasonable for simple images. Conversely, smaller training sites are required for spectrally complex images. Again, the training sites need to be distributed across the entire image, and they must capture the spectral variability of the image. And it's important to consider a little bit of housekeeping when dealing with the collection of training data sites to ensure consistency in the naming and labeling used. In a single date classification, normally we would use a single digit, such as the number one for forest, the number two for non-forest, number three for water, and so on. For a two date classification, we are interested in capturing the transitions or the changes that have occurred between the dates. And therefore, we need to capture this as follows. So forest to forest or stable forest would be coded 1-1. One, one. one for the first date, one for the second date. 1-2 would be used to capture a change from forest in the first date to non-forest in the second date. And code 2-1 would be used to capture non-forest in the first date and forest in the second date, and so on. Because we're using a decision tree classification approach, we do not need training data sites to be homogeneous. So this means that when collecting training data, it is feasible to mix forest types and non-forest land cover types. However, it's important to capture the spectral range throughout that class. And if you have an image with, with background pixels, which you generally will do when using Landsat, for example, you will need a class of that background area, which we generally assign the code 88. And now a few notes on supervised classification algorithms. They aim to classify the whole image by comparing the spectral characteristics of each pixel to the spectral characteristics of the training sites that have been collected. There are multiple different methods available. Some examples include the minimum distance, maximum likelihood classifier, spectral angle mapping, and random forest. In this webinar, we will use the random forest algorithm. The random forest algorithm is an example of an ensemble model, which means that it combines the results from multiple models. And the logic for this is that the result from this combination will be better than from a single model. It incorporates a supervised learning component, which means it gets better as it learns. And essentially, it uses two steps in that it takes a random set of the training sites, usually two-thirds, 
and build these multiple decision trees or classification trees. And then it uses the remaining third to both estimate error as well as highlight the importance of each predictor variable in the process. The trees that are developed have branches, and these are called nodes, as well as leaves, which are termed class labels. As mentioned, there is a random component to each decision. Think of this as, as a coin toss. And there is this continual learning component. The pixels are assigned to the classes based on a majority rule. So this adds an element of voting in that each decision tree votes on which class the pixel belongs to. And finally, while in this webinar, the exercise will be based on spectral data, random forests have the ability to incorporate additional data into the decision process such as DEMs, climate layers, vegetation maps, soil maps, etc., and can use both continuous or categorical data. A couple of advantages as well as limitations of random forests. In terms of advantages, there is no need for, for pruning of the trees that are generated. Overfitting is not a problem for random forests and can be a problem in, in other decision tree algorithms. It's not sensitive to outliers in the training data and it is easy to parameterize. The limitations include the algorithm cannot predict spectral ranges beyond the training data, which again reiterates the importance of capturing all of the spectral range in the training data. The image classification process is, is iterative. And the number of iterations will depend on the complexity of the image, the spectral complexity, the number of classes defined by the user, as well as the intended use of the final product. After each iteration, the user needs to review the results, to check the map accuracy, and then change and update the training data sites as needed rerun the random forest algorithm with the new training data. And then finally, conducting filtering as needed and then checking the map accuracy again. The post-processing steps can include filtering, which can be used to remove noise or isolated pixels that may have been incorrectly classified in the image. In the majority filter process, each group of pixels are considered in the map. The filter assigns the predominant class to the central pixel. And a user-defined number of pixels surrounding the central pixel may be used to change the class of that central pixel. And again, this post-processing step aims to remove noise or isolated pixels from the classification. So to recap the methodology, 
for the multi-date classification and change detection process. Step one and step two capture the, the pre-processing that is needed in terms of importing the imagery, applying a cloud mask if needed, and creating this two-date image stack. Step two is to perform image enhancement and different band combinations to exploit the different characteristics of the image. The third step is to develop the training site. And the fourth step is to run the training sites in the random forest algorithm. And in this webinar, we will be using R. Step five, five is to refine the classification through this iterative process. And again, step six is the post-processing step. And now I will pass this along to Amber and Cindy for the hands-on exercise. Thank you, Jenny, um, for that really clear presentation. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to step through exercise two um, and go through the methodology that Jenny explained um, so very clearly. So um, as we've talked about, first we're going to uh, stack the bands from two dates. We're going to generate training sites for our classification. And then we're going to jump into the R um, software to run the random forest algorithm. And then we're going to uh, look at the change image that we create and apply a color scheme that makes sense to us and then um, conduct some of the post-processing. And we won't be doing multiple iterations here, but as Jenny mentioned, that's a really important piece of um, this type of classification. So if you're running this in your own study area, um, check the accuracy and going back and, and looking at how well you did is really important. And um, we do have a, another webinar um, on our RSET website for accuracy assessment of a land cover map. So if you're interested in um, looking at the accuracy of, of your change map and um, conducting the iterations, we encourage you to go take a look at that webinar as well um, for some insight there. One other thing I wanted to mention before we, we get started, um, we've used the QGIS uh, 3.2 software in our previous exercise, but we also are going to be using the R statistical program as well as R studio here. So those are important that you have those ready to go and installed. And for the data, we're going to be using uh, two of the images we created in the week one exercise. So you do need to run that before you, you jump into this. And then we'll be using the um, classification R script that's available on the RSET website as well. So just make sure you have all of those ready to go and create a folder called exercise two um, on your computer before we get started. Okay, so um, you can follow along with me or um, you could just listen and maybe uh, view the recording at a later date to, to follow along with the exercise. So what we're gonna do first is we are just going to open up our QGIS. And what we're going to do is do the band stacking um, and a little bit of image enha enhancement. And so this is uh, similar to what we've done in the past, um, but we're going to stack the bands from both dates. So we're just gonna start a new project. And I'm just gonna make this full screen here so that we can see everything in our um, QGIS map. So the first thing we're gonna do is just navigate to our exercise one folder and add the 2000, uh, 1993 and the 2016 images. So we're going to go to la layer, add layer, and then add raster layer. 
navigating here to our folder and yours might look a little different. This is just how I have mine organized. And we're going to go ahead and add in the two dates from last exercise, the Tanzania 93 clip and 2016 clip. Click on open and then add and then close. Now what we're going to do is use the merge function to stack the bands of the two images. So we're going to come up here to raster, miscellaneous, and then merge. And so we're going to click on this, these three dots next to input layers and select both of our images. And it's really important here that we have the 1993 image on top of the um, 2016 image. We also want to make sure we place each input into a separate band. So each of those files have multiple bands and in the new file, um, the bands from both images will be included. We're going to keep the output type as float32. And then here on the merged, next to merge, we're just going to save this to a file. And here I'm in my change detection exercise two. And what we're going to um, change this to is tan1993-2016. Stacked. And we're just going to make sure that this is a TIFF file. If we specify .tiff here, that'll be just fine for us. Then click Save. And now we're going to click Run in Background. And now the process has run. And you can see we have a temporary merged file list, listed here. So um, for clarity in this exercise, so we can go ahead and close this. For clarity within this exercise, whenever we run some of these processes, um, a temporary file is created and automatically add, added to our, our QGIS map. However, we're just going to go ahead and remove these temporary files and add in the files that are actually saved in our file structure. This isn't an absolutely necessary step for you, but it really helps um, in making sure that we have the right file that we're using um, appropriately. So we're just going to um, right click on this merged file and go to remove layer. And then we're just going to go in and add the layer that we just created. So uh, layer, add layer, and add raster layer. And now we're going to navigate to our exercise two. And you can see we have this stacked TIFF here. And so we're just going to open that and add it. So now uh, we're just going to go ahead and save our project. Uh, I'm a big fan of saving along the way so you don't lose anything. Um, and we're just going to go to project and then save as, and you can save this as exercise two. And it'll automatically add the um, QGIS file extension. Click save. Now we're going to enhance the image like we did in exercise one. And um, as I've mentioned, this new image will have the bands from both dates. And we've included a link um, within the exercise. So for those of you that might be following along, we're on page four of the exercise, close to the bottom here. And we've added a link on um, Landsat band combinations. And so here's the link that we provided. And you can just see some common um, band combinations and uh, what bands they are to create these kinds of images. So color infrared, natural color, and false color. Um, so we'll be primarily focusing on false color here. OK, back to our map. So now what we're going to do is we're going to create duplicates of our stacked image in order to have essentially three different images. The first one displaying the bands of interest from 1993. The second one displaying the bands of interest from 2016. And the third displaying the change identified between those two images. 
and so we'll, we'll then use these three images to define our training classes to, to run our classification. So we're just going to create duplicates of this um, stacked image here. So we're just going to right click on this here and then go to uh, duplicate layer. So now we can see this copy here that was just created. And we're just going to go ahead and right click again and then rename this layer. And instead of copy at the end, we're just going to add 1993. So here's where we're going to display the bands from the 1993 image into this copy. OK, so now we're going to do the same thing where we duplicate our initial stacked image. Right click, duplicate layer, and then right click again and rename. And this is going to be our 2016 image. And then we're just going to change the name to this initial stacked one. Rename layer. And we're just going to add change at the end. And this is where we're going to display the bands from both dates that will uh, highlight the changes in um, forest cover between those two dates. And what we're going to do just to clean this up a bit is we're just going to remove the initial clipped images. So you can highlight those both. Right click and then remove layer. And OK. All right, so now we have our three images that we're going to use to um, compare here. So now what we're going to do is um, we'll first turn off all the layers except for our 1993 layer. And we're just going to change the uh, bands that are in each of these um, color channels to identify to be the bands of the 93 image. So we'll right click here and go to properties. And we're going to change this um, band combination to 543. So 5, 4, and 3. And now you'll notice, as I mentioned, that we have 13 bands here because it's the bands from both dates. Okay. So five, four, three. We're going to just modify our min and max settings. And again, this is just to um, change some of the, the visual colors that we are viewing. It doesn't really affect any of the values of the um, layers themselves. But we're going to go down here to min, uh, mean, plus or minus, a standard deviation of two. We can keep this here as the whole raster. Um, in exercise one, we just uh, down selected a specific area um, of our Landsat image to remove the clouds. But since we've already clipped the image, we can just apply it to the whole raster here. So then we could click apply and OK. So now you can see the areas uh, where we have um, forest identified in bright green and non forested areas identified in the purple colors here. So now we'll just repeat these steps for the 2016 stacked image. So again, turn that image on and go to properties. And now the band combination we're going to use are bands 12, 11 and 10. And that's because these bands correspond to bands 6, 5, and 4 of our second date, so our 2016 date. Again, we're going to change the min max value settings to this um, standard deviation stretch click apply and then OK. So similarly, the green areas are forested in 2016 and the purple areas are non forested in 2016. So if we just click these on and off, we can kind of already start to see how some of um, the features in this landscape are changing.
okay, so finally is to uh, repeat this for the change image. However, we're going to be using um, some of different bands here. So right click, going to properties. Now we're going to set these to bands 13, band 5, and band 8. And so Jenny mentioned this in um, the exercise today, but what this is showing you are the shortwave infrared bands from the 2016 image, from the 93 image, and then we're using the blue band from the 2016 image. For the min-max value settings, we're just going to go ahead and leave the default set here because that looks pretty good when we um, take a look. And then we'll click Apply and OK. So now what you can see are you'll notice that the areas that have lost forest land or have been deforested from between 1993 and 2016 appear in purple. And the areas in green are the areas that vegetation or forest has um, regrown or expanded between those two dates. The areas that are dark, um, this very dark green and black, uh, those are areas that have not changed, um, that have uh, remained, that were forest in 2000, in, were forest in 1993, and we're also still forest in 2016. And then the areas in white are areas that were, that were not vegetated, forested areas in either date. Um, so again, we can start to see some of these um, differences in the, the images here. So now that we have these um, three stacked images, we are going to create our training sites based on some of these features that we can now identify. So in order to do this, we're going to create a new polygon. And we will do this by going up to Layer, and then Create Layer, and then New Shapefile Layer. We are going to navigate to our Exercise to Folder. And we're going to go ahead and call this Training. And it's really important that you call it training and you spell it correctly in order for our um, R code to work later on in this exercise. So just be really cognizant of that. And it's a training shapefile, SHP. Click Save. We'll keep our file encoding as UTF-8. This may or may not be the default, depending on um, some of the versions are a little slightly different between Mac and PC, but just make sure that's um, UTF-8. We're going to change the geometry type to polygon because we're going to create polygons. And then um, we're also going to make sure that our uh, reference system is this projected reference system. And again, um, the names might be slightly different. It might have project at the beginning or the end of the name, depending on um, if it's a Mac or PC. But um, just have, making sure that it's the projected um, WGS 84 UTM zone 37 north. And this is in order to have our new polygon uh, shapefile match the um, coordinate system of our Landsat images so that it all lines up um, and is found in the same spatial place. Under new field, we're going to um, type in notes here. Because for each polygon we create, we're going to make a little note on um, what kind of change we're observing. And then the length, we can go ahead and change to 20. And then we want to make sure we click on this Add Fields to List so that we see the notes down here. So that'll just be another feature in your attribute table for your shapefile layer. Then we're going to go ahead and click OK. Now you can see that we have a new training layer added to our map here on the left. And for this exercise, we are going to keep our uh, change categories really simple. We are only going to identify forest to non-forest. 
and then whether or not that um, we see change or, or not in those simple categories. So again, if you're following along with us, we're now at um, towards the bottom of page nine, where you can see the cover classes and the code that we're going to give to each of these classes. So you may be working in an area that's uh, much more um, complicated you might want to have many different classes. Uh, you might want to look at things like urbanization. So you could have an urban class maybe, um, but that presents some difficulties um, in calculating accuracy and, and things like that. Um, so depending on what your area looks like, that's going to be what you want to use for your, for your classes. But just note that um, the larger the number of classes, the more training sites you have to create, and um, the potential is there for less accuracy in your maps, um, especially with things like urban areas, as those often have um, low accuracy due to potential for vegetation within those urban areas and getting confused with the pixels. So, so we're keeping it really simple for you, but just to note that you can make it more difficult on yourself if you want. Okay, so now what we're going to do here is we're just going to make sure that um, we have our layers in the right order. So this makes, um, makes a little bit sen more sense to us here. And we have our training polygon on top, our stacked change 2016 and 1993. So we're good there. Now what we're going to do is start to draw some of these polygons. And the first feature, the first uh, training type that we're going to do is going to be code 11. So this is going to be an area where it, it was forested in 93 and is still forested in 2016. So those are going to be the really dark regions that we see on our map here. So in order to start to draw some of these features, we want to make sure that um, we, we click right click on the training polygon and then we're going to click on toggle editing once you do that you should see a digitizing toolbar that pops up here along the top what we want to do is we want to use this add polygon feature to create these training sites once you click on that you'll notice that there's a crosshair that appears when we hover over the map and that's going to be where we select our area. So now we want to really zoom in to a region that we don't see a lot of change. So we're just going to start simple, maybe um, take a look at this area here and zoom right in where we think it's a forest in both images. Again, um, you can use your pan tool, um, the little hand to kind of move around and what I really recommend is first we have the change image um, shown, but then let's just take a look at both both years to see if we're still um, kind of seeing the same patterns. So we do see some pink areas of non-forested, but we do see some areas that really look heavily forested in both regions. And I'm kind of looking right in here now. So it's really dark in our change image, green in 2016, also pretty green in 93. So that looks like a good area for me. Now I'm just gonna, again, make sure I have my create polygon selected and I'm just gonna click on the map here and you could see it starts to create this polygon and then um, clicking in four places and then to um, stop the polygon from being created, we just left or right click, excuse me. So once you right click there, you'll be asked to put in an ID and notes. So our ID is 11 and our notes are forest to forest, four, four. That all looks good, then we click okay. Now you can see your polygon shown here. So what we're gonna wanna do is repeat this step. Um, so this is a little tedious. Um, so bear with us, uh, you have to create multiple tra training polygons for each of those classes that you um, want, where you want to identify change or no change, right? 
And we want to make sure that we have enough pixels to select from when we run our training algorithm so that um, the training algorithm does a really good job. Um, so you can be as particular as you'd like. Um, I'm going to sort of maybe a little more quickly go through this process, but select about 10 polygons in each of these categories. So what I like to do um, sort of is, is zoom to the entire layer and um, kind of get, get started with another area. So this looks pretty dark and green in, in both uh, dark in the change and pretty green in both of these, maybe especially right over here. So again, I'm just going to come in and it's up to you which uh, layer you have shown when you actually create your polygon whatever you're whatever you're feeling and then again this is id 11 and this is forest to forest and what's really important here is that we make sure we get the id right every time if we have a typo with one of the ids it might create some errors in creating your um, classes later on so again i'm just gonna um, zoom out so that we have two now and as you can see this process might take quite a while but the more you do it, the uh, better you'll become. So again, this, this looks like a pretty good area. Oh, it's also a good point that you always have to have your training file selected and then the um, add polygon feature uh, before you can um, create your polygon here. So as you can see, the more you do it, uh, the better you should um, you should become. And one other thing to note is that it's it's pretty important to um, try to create your training sites and distribute them across the entire image. So that really helps with um, making sure you have kind of the spatial distribution um, that's useful here. Again, we're just going to go in and create our little polygon where we don't see much change. And you may or may not agree with my training sites. Um, this part is a little subjective, so um, it'll be a little different for everybody. OK, so now that we've created a, some of training sites from the forest to forest, so the areas of no change, we are going to create some polygons for the next ID. And this will be areas that were forested in 93, but were not forested in 2016. So these areas are going to be shown in this bright sort of magenta um, purple in our change image that we see here. So we'll first um, just zoom in to an area that looks very purple in our change and then we'll take a look so here is the 2016 image it looks pretty bare no no forested areas there and then with our 1993 we can see some green pixels so we know that there was forest and then there wasn't so now we'll just create a polygon in this area And we're going to change this ID to 1, 2. And the notes are forest to non-forest. Click OK. That's great. So then we'll um, zoom out and we'll do a few more of these areas. So you can see some really bright regions coming up in our change image that are, are very clear. And so we need to make sure we have our training feature selected. And just um, going in and selecting a lot of these um, sort of purpley colors here. And again, I'm just now showing the 2016 image, but it's up to you um, which, which uh, date you want to view when you're creating your training features. So this is forest to non-forest. And this is 12, OK. 
So then we'll repeat that process for about 10 or so training sites for the forest to non-forest category. Again, where we see these really bright magenta regions and we wanna get a good distribution across our image as well. So now I'm gonna move on to our um, next ID and this is gonna be areas that were not forest in either region. So this is gonna be ID 22 and it's gonna be non-forest to non-forest. So these are gonna be areas maybe that were urban in both images. And these will be indicated as white in our change image. So we can see there's a town here, there's another um, looks like small village here. So we'll really focus on these white areas. And this might be one of the more difficult uh, training uh, class types because we do see a lot of variability in these types of urban areas. Um, but we'll, we'll do our best here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and zoom in to this, this very white area here. And again, you can see there's a lot of variety of pixels, but it looks pretty uh, pink in 2016 as well as in 93. So again, just toggling back and forth. And I'm just gonna go ahead and select um, some of these pixels here. Now this category is gonna be ID 22, and it's non-forest to non-forest. Okay. Again, it helps just to kind of zoom out, zoom to layer, and the change image really is the best, I think, for first identifying the regions where you wanna zoom into. And then you can kind of go back and forth between the, the two images and say, oh, okay, those both look like non-forested in both of my dates. So I'm just gonna go in and select some of these pixels here. ID 22, again, non-forest to non-forest. Okay. Now back to zooming out to the layer. And then what you'll wanna do is add as I mentioned, about 10 classes for um, 10 polygons for, for this class as well. In the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and move on to our final um, category, which was not forest in 1993, but is forest in 2016. So these areas might be areas of, of reforestation, um, or they might be areas where there was a fire close to or just before the 93 image, but then the, the forest has re, regrown um, in 2016. And so these areas are gonna be the bright green areas that you see in your map. So we'll just go ahead and zoom in to this very green region here in the change. And then you can see 2016 looks pretty green, 93 does not. So this is gonna be a really good area to choose our site. And for our final ID, this is gonna be 21. And this is gonna be non-forest to forest. And then put our change image back on. This area looks pretty good. Looks like uh, we've had some regrowth here. Looks pretty green and looks pretty non-green. So I'm just going to select some of this area here. 21 and non-forest to forest. Okay. So again, we're gonna repeat this process for many different uh, training polygons. Here's another really good area where it looks um, pretty green in 2016, but not in um, 93. And I'll just create one final polygon here. And you can see there might be some error here in, in what I'm doing. 
um, as I create these cover types. Um, and this also just kind of highlights the um, usefulness of being very meticulous when creating your training samples. So once you've done this for each of the categories, and you have about 10 for each category, we're going to go um, and right click here on our training polygon and then go to save layer edits. And then we're just going to turn the, to the toggle editing off so that we don't make any other changes. And again, it's always good to save your map along the way. So now the next step that we're going to do is we're going to run the random forest classification algorithm in our R program. Um, so we're going to jump into to that. So now we're going to minimize our QGIS layer and open up our studio. Now remember, um, you need to have your classification file saved somewhere on your computer in order to run this here. Now you can see that I, um, once I've opened my R studio, I was practicing with the script earlier, so it came up automatically. But if um, you have not done that, you simply go here to open file, navigate to your folder, and then you can find your um, classification R file. And then you'll just click open here and you'll see exactly what I see in my um, console. So for those of you that are not very familiar or comfortable with R, we're not going to be doing a lot of modification of the code here. And R Studio is really great because it has a lot of point and click options. Um, so you don't need to really understand what's going on in this entire code. Um, but just to give you a little um, overview, everything that has this hashtag area and, um, and text here that's shown in green is our notes. So if you want to read through this, you can kind of see what's going on with the script and um, all the features, who created it. You can also look at the references in our exercise. And then you can start to see here where we have uh, blue and black code is where um, part of the, this is actually uh, parts of the code that are going to be running. So um, that's just a little note about the way that things are color coded in, in the R Studio. Um, you can also change these, these color coding um, options. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to set our working directory so that we know, um, so we tell R to essentially look in the right place to find our images in our training file. So we're going to come up here to session and then set working directory and we're going to choose directory. And then you're going to come in to your folder, your file structure, and just set it as exercise two. So it's really important that you save everything just to that exercise two folder without any subfolders so that R can actually access the right things. Once you've selected that, click open. And now we've, we've set our working directory here. Then you should, you should see the images. If you have your files um, option open here, you should see uh, all your files in that folder here. Now we just need to install a few really important packages. So if we just come up here to tools and install packages, then you're going to type in these packages we have listed now on page 14 of our exercise, map tools. And so if you start to type them in, you should see them pop up here automatically. So uh, map tools. And then we just want to space in between each of the packages. So SP. If you don't see it popping up, that means you might not have the right version of R. So just um, be uh, mindful. And you need internet connection in order to, um, to um, download these new uh, packages. So I'm just going through these five that we have listed. Okay, map tools, SP, ra random forest, raster, and RGDoll. Now, 
you can click here on Install Packages. Then this process will run. You might see some, um, uh, some red code happening here, and this is just um, letting you know um, sort of some attributes of the packages. Um, but you should see that um, the package is installed correctly with this black code showing up in your console. And then whenever R is ready to continue, once everything's done, you'll see a little blue arrow. So that all looked good. I downloaded my packages. So now we just need to change two lines of this code. And the reason we're changing this is um, very specific to each individual user. So you're going to need um, to change yours to modify your code um, a little differently than everyone else. So here, if we, um, if we navigate here down to line 65, you can see we have notes along the way. So we're just gonna set our working directory. Now mine is already set, and this is the directory that you will have in the R code that you obtain. Now that's not gonna work because the for you, because your uh, computer will be referencing a different um, set of folders. So what you need to do here is just change each of these to uh, point R to the place where you have your documents stored. So this might be, you know, desktop, change detection, exercise two, um, whatever that may be. Just make sure that this is correct. Double check for typos because it'll it's um it needs to be exact, and um, make sure that you have uh, your your, especially your stacked band image and your training um, shape file all located in the same folder without any subfolders. Really important there. So that'll be the first thing you change. And then the second thing you change is, is very similar here in line 67. So again, you can see this is referencing my file structure you're gonna to wanna to change that to your file structure. And then again, as I mentioned, having the training shape file and all spelled correctly. Um, so this is essentially setting the working directory within your code and then making sure that you're referencing your training shape file when we run this classification system. Now, um, for those of you that might be interested, We've um, included um, on the bottom of page 16 of the exercise a little bit more information about what the, the other pieces of the code are doing. And we're not going to run through it here, but um, you can see um, things like class numbers. These are the same classes that we created in our, our um, training and the number of samples, et cetera. So you can look through that code at your leisure. So once you've done, you've changed these two lines of code everything should be good. Um, you might want to go up to file and then save your, your code if you've made those edits. Now what should happen is we should be able to click on source and the entire code should run. So go ahead and click here. So when the code is running you'll start to see these uh, notes coming at you from R. So um, it created the training data to train the model, pixel values, and then you'll see this um, little note here. And all you need to do here is type in um, any, really any key besides those keys that it mentioned. So I'm just gonna type in K and then hit enter. So long as it's not C or S or N. <laughs> So I'm just going to use K, and now you'll see that um, the, the code is essentially creating those random forest blocks and training the model and running the processing um, that Jenny mentioned. You also will see a little um, image being created here along the side 
for each of the classes. We're not going to talk about any of that, but that's um, more things you can investigate if you want to um, sort of look at some of the uh, attributes that, that are happening here. Okay, so great. Our, our, our code ran. Um, again, as I mentioned, if you want to assess the accuracy of your newly created map, um, you can here look here at the confusion matrix. And so again, take a look at our um, accuracy assessment exercise if you want more info on that. So now um, we are done with the running of the R code, and we're going to go back to our um, QGIS to analyze the map and do a little bit of cleaning up. So you can go ahead and minimize this, and we're just going to jump right back in to our um, exercise two of our um, QGIS. If you want to double check to make sure that your code ran properly, you can just take a look here at your exercise two folder. Now what you should see most importantly is this new stacked class TIFF. And this is where um, we've classified our change image. So that's there, that's all good. We're gonna go ahead and add that layer into our map. Now, you'll see here, um, again, this may be a slight variation depending on Mac versus PC. You'll either see one through four or you'll see 11 through 22. And so these are just those categories that we created in our training file. So we're just gonna come in and um, just really make a few different symbology changes um, and take a closer look at this. So right click, go to properties, we're changing the render type to single band pseudo color. Our interpolation, I'm gonna go ahead and use exact here. It should work for linear or exact. For our mode, we're gonna to change to equal interval. And then for our classes, we're gonna have four. So now each of these four uh, different values correspond to those four categories. So um, we're just gonna um, change these colors and labels to uh, be more appropriate. So one corresponds to 11. So we're gonna make this label, we're gonna double click here on this label and this is our forest to forest category. And then we're gonna change the color and um, we can use standard colors and just change that to black and click OK. Now, our second label, this is the forest to non-forest. Category. Two corresponds to 21. And we're going to change this color and we're going to make this color red to indicate deforestation. You can change these colors to something different if you'd like. Value three or 21 is non-forest to forest. And we'll go ahead and just change this to green. And finally, 22 or four is non-forest to non-forest, so no change there. And we'll just make this yellow. Again, you can change this to whatever color you'd like. So now we can click apply. Don't close this window just yet, but you can see our categories shown in the, the image. What we want to do is we want to save these colors and these categories because we're um, going to make some changes to um, our map and we want to use this, these again. And I just noticed I had a typo. Forest to forest, forest to non-forest, non-forest, forest, non-forest, non-forest. <laughs> non okay, now we can apply. So what we want to do here is click on this export color map to file. And we're just gonna save this 
in our exercise two folder as class colors. Click save. And now we can click OK. So as Jenny mentioned, we want to essentially look at the accuracy of our map and conduct multiple iterations of that entire training samples and random forest algorithm. So we're not doing that here to save time, um, but I want to recognize that that is an important process in um, creating a map that has the kind of accuracy that's useful for you. So what we're just going to do now is run a few processes to clean up the image a bit. The first is going to be that majority filter that we had um, talked about before. To find the majority filter tool, we're going to come up here to processing and then toolbox. And you can see that I recently used the majority filter, um, but you can go ahead and type in majority filter here and then you should find it um, pop up here. And we'll just double click on it there. We want to make sure our stacked classified image is shown in the grid. We're going to leave everything else as default and then click here to save the file under filtered grid. And we're just going to call this. We're going to call this image. Tan 93 2016 stacked class three by three. And we're going to go ahead and save the file type as sdat. And um, this is just a, a file that a uh, type of file that's used commonly with QGIS. And click on Save, and then click on Run. And now this process will run. And what this is doing is essentially um, cleaning up our image and removing some of the noise in the image. And um, you'll see that after the process runs, um, the process list will disappear and you see a new image was just added to our map. So what we can do is go ahead and close the majority filter tool. Again, it's, it shows up as, as this black and white, gray color kind of image. And we'll just apply the same color scheme that we applied to the previous image by right clicking, going to properties, changing this to single band pseudo color. And then what we can do since we've already saved our color class, is we can load the color map from the file. Click on class color that we just created, and look at that. It added all of our um, colors and labels appropriately. Saves us a lot of time there. Then we click Apply and OK. And as I mentioned previously, um, what we want to essentially do is to um, color up our, our images that we create when we export the file. And here you'll see filtered grid is um, just that temporary file again. And um, what, what we're going to go ahead and do is remove this layer and add in our actual raster that was created just to make sure that we are doing the right thing here. So our three by three SDAT. Add, close, and then right clicking here, going to properties, single band pseudo color, coming in and adding that color class. Okay, so now we can see if we turn on and off these, uh, the uh, majority filter image and the initial image, you'll see some differences in sort of these stray pixels and the speckle effect. So it looks a little nicer there. So we're going to apply one final type of filter, and this is the Civ tool. So again, in our processing toolbox, we are going to look up our Civ, and I've just recently used it so I could find it here. Double click. We are going to use this three by three input layer from our majority filter. So we're going to continually um, decrease the noise in the image, um, make it look a little bit more clear, make those classes more defined. We're going to leave the threshold default eight to 10. 
we're going to click on use eight connectedness and this is just a feature of using eight, eight, eight pixels um, in a connected network in our sieve and then we are going to save this save it to a file and then we're just going to add in se at the end of this file to denote that it's this final filter method that we're doing click on save and then again run in background so now that was pretty quick as well we're going to go ahead and close the um, tool again i'm just going to go ahead and remove this temporary layer and add in the actual layer that we created by navigating to my folder here and you'll see it's this sdat file here with the se at the end click add close so let's go ahead and change those properties again very simply single band pseudo color opening up our color class clicking open apply and okay so now what we can see is we can take a look at our our two different filters and our initial image and um, really see the differences here so just starting with our initial image majority filtered image and our sieved image you can see how how much clearer those look as we um, click these on and <clears throat> click these on and off So the final thing we want to do is just export this final map. We're, we're happy with that map, with this map. We're going to right click on it here, go to export and then save as. We're going to save this here as a GeoTIFF. We're going to navigate to our exercise two folder and we're just going to save this as TAN 1993. 2016 change final click save and then um, we'll make sure we're in this projected um, file um, type and then we'll just click OK and you know if we want to change these properties we can we don't necessarily need to because it's the same um, map that we just took a look at but why not so now we have our, our final change map here so what we can start to do is analyze these um, changes in the map you can see um, there are quite a quite a lot of red areas where we're seeing deforestation happen this area in green um, maybe a previous fire that's now been reforested. Um, and we can start to look at some of these patterns um, across our image. And again, it's really important to look at the accuracy of your map. Um, if you have any kind of ground data, that's really useful as well. Um, so uh, we can take a look at all of those things at the end of our um, exercise. So the final thing to do, just go ahead and save your map. And that is the completion of our exercise two. Um, so we'll just wrap up here um, by um, making a few uh, comments about our um, about our, our webinar series as a whole here. Um, again, just a reminder um, that for the land management and wildfire areas of RSET, you can contact um, myself or my colleague Cindy Schmidt. With any questions, um, we uh, please contact our uh, program um, director, Anna Prados, with any uh, general RSET questions, and then our website's listed here. So I want to thank you all for participating in um, this um, more advanced webinar series. It's one of the most advanced that we've done. And so now, um, with the time that we have left in this session, we will uh, take your questions. So I'll go ahead and start with the questions. The first question is, how can I apply the cloud elimination algorithm? Um, actually, the first two questions have to do with, um, with cloud masking. Um, one thing I want to um, note is that I posted a link 
to a cloud masking plugin that's available through QGIS. We haven't demonstrated it in this webinar, um, but I highly recommend that you download that plugin and take a look at that. Um, oftentimes, there is no set algorithm, um, so you can use the Q&A image provided by the Landsat Surface Reflectance product, and then um, with QGIS or actually any other image processing or GIS package, you can use the raster calculator to figure out which pixels, um, what, the, what the pixel values are for the clouds and the cloud shadows, and you can create a mask and just eliminate those pixels from your image. That is typically the way that you do it. One thing that we're thinking about based on the questions that we're getting um, is maybe doing a very quick webinar on how to do club, um, cloud masking. It will probably, not sure if it will happen in 2019 or depending on our schedule, but just to let you know um, that we think it might be a really good idea to show a short webinar on how to do cloud masking. So now I'm going to jump to question three. Which of the two ways do you recommend to improve the visualization of the image, the stretch or the combination of bands, and how to select one or the other way? So my answer is usually you use both. So you need to stretch the image to see the feature, any of the features better. You always have to stretch the image. Um, and then you need to use the different combinations of bands to see the image in color. So the band combination that you choose depends on whatever your preference is um, and whatever features you are interested in. Um, this may be another great um, idea for a short webinar is to show the different band combinations and how they highlight different features. But we did find a really great link that describes the different band combinations, um, specifically for Landsat 8, but you can also transfer that to Landsat 5 or 7, for looking at um, different features. So it gives you all different band combinations and what they're um, good for looking at. So I, I recommend that you um, take a look at that link. Question four. How can we reduce spectral mixing of different classes during unsupervised classification? So in other words, two different types of vegetation having spectral similar reflectance. Um, is it an inherent property of satellite data? So a Landsat pixel averages the spectral reflectance of everything on the ground within that pixel. That's just how that works. Um, so Landsat pixel is a 30 meter pixel, so everything within that 30 by 30 meter pixels averaged. So in these classification processes, whether you're using unsupervised or supervised or whatever, there's really no way to get around that. Um, the process is actually looking at the average reflectance. However, there are some unmixing algorithms that you can, to some extent, um, it will give you an idea of what percentage of land covers in each pixel, but that's not something we address in this webinar, and it's, it's also quite advanced. Question five, in, the random, in random forest, it's not required to select pure training areas. Does this mean that you can select training areas without specific care? For example, can a class of latifolia be mixed with soil and other types of vegetation? Uh, so it depends. Um, it's always, you know, although you can sort of get other kinds of land cover mixed in with your classes, um, you can do that only if you don't have separate classes for those other things. So, for example, if you have a cloud class, if you're if you're wanting to create like a cloud class and you want to include shadows, then that class will be called cloud and shadow, and you can include both clouds and shadows in that. So in this case, if you have a certain type of vegetation that you're trying to um, collect training information on, and it's blended with other things, but that's the nature of that class, then you can include those other things in your class. So there are lots of questions about um, the random forest algorithm. 
and um, the R script. So we're not going to be addressing specific information about the R script, but what I really recommend is that, you, first of all, you can go, um, this particular script was written by Ned Horning at the American Museum of Natural History. So I want to give him huge credit for writing this great random forest R script. Um, and, you, and we've posted the website both here in this question and answer document, and then I also posted it earlier in the chat box. Um, I recommend that you go there. There is some information, additional information about the R script there. And then if you have specific questions about that script, I recommend that you email Ned. Um, his email is, is listed on that website and ask him specific questions about that R script. Is it, question seven, is it important to have roughly the same number of pixels in each class when using this method? No, you don't need to use the same number of pixels um, in each class. You probably want to have a minimum number of pixels. Um, you don't want to have a bunch of small um, classes, but it doesn't, you don't need to have the same number of pixels per class. Question eight. If I want to classify the type of crops in agriculture, which one is the is best among pixel-based and object-based classification? Is it possible to classify crops at field level using Sentinel data? So this webinar is really about change detection and not necessarily about land cover classification. Um, and so if you could, whoever asked that question, if you could send us an email, we might be able to give you some better information on agricultural classification um, since we're just focusing on change detection for this particular webinar series. So question nine, how do I use land change detection to map biological diversity and species distribution of animals with respect to change in their microhabitats? Okay, I think there are whole papers written on that question. So again, I don't think that's something we can easily answer in this short Q&A session. So if you could, send that question to us separately. We might be able to um, give you some references or later on, I'll try to go back to this question and see if we can post it in this Q&A. The question 10, can we do this process if we have three or more images of different ears? Yes, you can do the same process with multiple images. I also want to remind you um, if you didn't watch um, the webinar last week that sometime in 2019 we will also be doing a webinar on time series analysis which allows you to do multiple time series um, in one algorithm and so this particular one is really just looking at two or three dates you could add another image um, if they're in there if you wanted to but there are some other algorithms out there that allow you to look at multiple dates um, of imagery and process them. So there's a question about how you can use your results to, this is question 11, to look at iterating the process so typically what you do after a classification, and in this case um, using the classification to look at change, is you analyze your training statistics, which we didn't do in this um, class. But um, again, maybe that's another webinar we can do um, later on. But you analyze your straight training statistics, and this particular R code provide you with some outputs that you can use to analyze your training statistics. And then you can decide whether the training sites are, are good um, or they're not good and you eliminate them. 
Um, uh, and then once you change the training sites, you know, whether you're eliminating them or you're adding more, some classes might need more, then you run the algorithm again. So there's a question 12, could you explain if we could use ground truth points to classify the image in QGIS? Yes, you can use the ground truth points. If you have ground truth points, then you would create a shape file based on those ground truth points, and then you go through the same process um, with points rather than polygons. Question 13 um, has been answered. What is the difference between a SDAT image and a TIFF image? So the SDAT file is a different type of gridded file that um, one of the tools, Saga tools, use in QGIS. So that's a tool associated with QGIS. Um, so you will need to create those SDAT files um, in those final processing steps. We did an exercise two. But you can always export the files as a TIFF if you're using them in either ArcGIS or QGIS or some other um, software. And there's a link um, that explains it as well. There's a question 14, besides random forest, which other machine learning methods are out there for image classification? We'll have to investigate that um, and give you some ideas. We're really just focusing on random forest for this particular uh, webinar. But, I mean, you could easily do a search yourself on machine learning algorithms for cl image classification um, and get that answer also. So it says, you mentioned in random forest for training data, it's important for covering the entire brightness range. Um, how do you ensure your training data is doing that? It's a really great question. Uh, one way is to make sure that you're getting a good distribution of your training data. Um, the other way, um, sometimes you don't actually know until you analyze your training sites afterwards. So again, we didn't do that in this particular exercise, but there are some products that are produced um, from the R code, from the random force algorithm that allows you to look at your training site statistics. And it really gives you a good idea of um, how well you did in characterizing the spectral variability. Oh, Amber, you're actually, I just answered question 16. So the answer to that um, is am, question 16. <laughs> Sorry. So there's question 15, which I should have answered first. Uh, can I combine images with different spe spatial resolution and run random forest? I believe you have to have the same spatial resolution because it's comparing, um, it's for change detec detection especially, it's, it's looking at the difference in spectral value between two pixels. So if you have different spatial resolutions, uh, it, won't be able, it won't be able to look at the difference between two spectral values very easily. So having two images of the same spatial resolution is important. So the question is, why did you choose to do the classification on RStudio, not QGIS or Envy? Um, we wanted to use Random Forest, which is available with the R code. Envy, we don't do our webinars using Envy because it's a commercial software package and many of our um, registrants for this webinar don't have access to that package. So we like to use open source software whenever we can for our RSET webinars. Question 18, how do we deal with the same random force process if there are multiple years map? Uh, 
what will be the different band combinations for displaying the change. So I'm not exactly sure what the question is here. Are you asking if there are more than two years? You can add a third year if you want. You just stack them all together and then, um, it, you know, for, for looking at, at imagery, um, stack together, if you're trying to look at one image and change over those two dates, then you can only do those two dates. But for processing, you can use multiple dates. Um, and again, in 2019, we will be doing a webinar on time series, which allows you to look at more than two dates of imagery. It's a different kind of processing approach. Question 19, does cloud elimination algorithm affect the reflection after removing clouds from the image? No, it doesn't affect any of the pixel values that don't have clouds um, after removing the clouds. You literally just pull out those pixels from that image. Is it required to classify all spatial variation in an image that you are not interested in. Let's say, for example, I'm interested in different forest types in wetlands, but I'm not interested in other forest types. So usually with satellite imagery in an image, you need to classify all the variation in that image. Um, even though you're only interested in one class. Now, if you can cut down the size of your image to just include the area that you're interested in, then you'll have less spatial variation. So the last question, if I don't have ground truth points, is there any other way to assess the accuracy, assess the accuracy of classified results? So there's several ways you can do it. If you don't have ground truth points, you can use high spatial, you can use higher spatial resolution imagery like from, um, from Google Maps or Google Earth. Um, that's a visual interpretation that you would do. So you would have to know that area ahead of time. You can also use other Landsat imagery. I mean, some people, um, if they don't have good ground control points and you don't have access to aerial photographs or high spatial resolution imagery, you can actually use Landsat imagery to help you identify what those points are. It won't be as good as if you had ground truth, but you can do it that way. Somebody asked how good is um, there's a plugin for QGIS for change detection. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question because we haven't used that plugin. So there's a question, is the spatial resolution of the images important for picking pixel-based classification? Um, if one processes, say, UAV images, maybe object-based is better. Yeah, typically um, for high spatial resolution, uh, people like to use object-based because in, say, UAV imagery or in other high spatial resolution imagery, it's quite noisy. And so trying to do a pure spectral-based um, pixel classification can get very confusing. Um, and so a lot of people like to use object-based classification for that. And then there's a question, for which reason have you chosen standard deviation of two during image processing? So 
standard deviation of two just is just a stretch you do on the imagery. It's a typical stretch that captures most of the spectral range of the imagery and cuts off the tails. There are many different ways you can stretch it. That's just a standard way of doing it. So that's just a way we chose. You can choose a different way if you'd like. All right, so question 25 is the question I was expecting. <laughs> Surprised it wasn't asked earlier. Can you use a tool in QGIS to determine the percentage of area in each class? Um, yes, you can. So that's one thing we didn't demonstrate, and I will um, answer this question more specifically in the Q&A that you can look up afterwards. But um, in QGIS, if you go to the tools that include grass tools um, on the right panel, there's a tool called rstats, r.stats, and you can use that tool to look at the area for each class. Actually, I'll bring it up right now so you all can see it. Hopefully you can see my QGIS window right now. I have a different image up at the moment. It isn't the same image that you use, but I can still show you this is a land cover classification. Um, and to get the, the stats, you go on the, first you have to open the processing toolbox, which is up here. Click on processing and toolbox. And that brings up these tools on the side here. I'm going to close this so you can see it all. So you see all the tools. You see GDAL, grass, um, Saga, etc. So if you click on grass and then you click on raster and you scroll down till you see R dot stats. It's right here. And you click on it. So you can select your land cover map here. And then down here at the bottom, you see where it says you can click print area totals, or you can print cell counts um, for each class. And you'll want to click off one cell range per line. So that allows you to get area totals or cell counts, whatever you want. You can also print the category labels. Um, but this is a great function for, for getting the area for each class. Oh, and just to let you know, I actually am running the older version of QGIS on my computer here. It's 2.0. 1, 8, um, but I'm pretty sure it has the same function in the in the newer version as well. So at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and um, end the webinar for today. We want to thank you all for joining us. We had a great turnout today. Um, I know there were a lot of questions, um, uh, not about change detection, but about classification. Uh, if you want to send those questions to me, um, uh, send them via email. That would be great, and I'll be able to get I'll be able to answer them a little bit more thoroughly that way. It's hard to do it um, in the Q&A period uh, for this webinar series. So we hope you enjoyed it. Um, let us know if you have any questions or any issues as you're running through the exercise this week. Um, again, if you want more um, answers about this specific script, I recommend that you go to the American Museum of Natural History website that we listed earlier. Um, they'll be able to give you a lot more questions. Um, and please let us know how you're using um, all of these uh, processes and algorithms in your work. We always enjoy hearing that. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, we hope you join us for our, our next webinar um, sometime in the next few months. Thanks a lot.